So today we're going to consider the question whether the Buddha really existed and whether it matters for our practice. Coming right up. So I'm Doug Smith. I'm study director at the Secular Buddhist Association. That's secularbuddhism.org. If you're new to the channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a less stress-filled life, consider subscribing. So today's video was uh, prompted by a question by Tricia Hutchins, who basically asks uh, about the, the, the historical validity of the early material and the Buddha's existence. Uh, she asks, um, do you ever have doubts about the historical reality of a guy called Siddhartha Gotama, who, for whatever reason, became personally enlightened and started the whole thing? This is a question I think has concerned many of us. Uh, some of us it doesn't concern at all, but many of us it does. And so it's something worth at least taking some time and giving a sort of an introduction to the, to the, to the issues and the questions, because of course this is a huge and contested, somewhat contested kind of, uh, of question. I think the question comes up a lot because there is a lack of archaeological evidence much prior to the time of King Ashoka, the reign of King Ashoka, which would have been, you know, probably 150 years after the Buddha's lifetime. And at that point we do get uh, texts in, in stone that was carved in stone by uh, people directed by Ashoka, and some of them do seem to refer to particular Buddhist texts. They seem to refer to the Dharma in kind of Buddhist terms. And so at that point, we do get something that we can sort of point to as, if you like, hard evidence. Before that, there really isn't very much. Um, and the archaeological evidence is, is scanty, perhaps because there just aren't very many remains from that early period. A lot of their, the things that they would have constructed houses out of would have been wood, would have been thatch. Uh, it might have been stones, but not many. Uh, and so one assumes that a lot of uh, the actual uh, physical evidence probably didn't survive very long. We also, of course, have to keep in mind that the evidence that we have from, from early Buddhism, from the time of the Buddha, was oral, was, was uh, transmitted orally for well over a century, and perhaps over two centuries, uh, that would have been, uh, at least arguably, it was supposed to have been memorized by the followers of the Buddha soon after he, he, he passed on, and at that point would have been, uh, again, memorized and remembered. But this assumes, of course, that the, the memories are accurate, at least relatively accurate. It assumes that there actually was, you know, that this actually all did take place because, you know, even on the story of what went on back then, we're relying on memory. We're relying on, you know, decades and centuries of people uh, basically uh, playing a long game of telephone, telling each other what they remembered having heard. And if we look at the texts that are available to us today, uh, we, we see various what we call recensions of those or examples of those, the most famous being the Pali Canon, which is the only uh, complete group of these early texts that exists in a language uh, close to or identical to the one that the Buddha himself might have spoken. Uh, there's some disagreement about whether it's close to that language or the same. Nevertheless, um, that's the, the most famous. Then, of course, we have we have a group in Chinese called the Agamas, which uh, are roughly speaking translations or you know translations of similar kinds of texts into Chinese from uh, an ancient Indian language. And we also have examples in Sanskrit, which are, are quite old. And so the question is, uh, if, we, if we look at what, what remains to us about the sort of the evidence, the textual evidence, we'll find that there are a, a quite a number of discrepancies. In other words, the, the texts are certainly organized in very different ways. Uh, texts seem to have been shuffled around. Uh, the you know, if we look at a particular text, uh, you know, a sutta that we might, you know, be discussing on this, on this channel, and we look at the, the Chinese example, it may have a material that in Pali is somewhere else, and it may uh, lack material that in Pali is in that text, but just isn't in the Chinese or whatever. So there clearly were, as we might expect, issues of remembering and transmitting these, these texts orally and then getting them then written down. And then, of course, once they're written down, probably starting in the second century or first century uh, BCE, at that point, uh, even just, uh, you know, getting the, the, the written texts transmitted over centuries and millennia is itself a, a great uh, achievement and in itself is also going to be... Um, uh, full of errors and, and just different ways of, of organizing and doing things. 
So the texts themselves uh, have problems, and there, of course there are many, many differences, as I say, between the different recensions. Even within, let's say, the Pali Canon, there are different, different recensions of the Pali Canon. Of course, they have differences with one another, which have to be reconciled when we, when we come to you know, a, an authoritative contemporary example of, let's say, one of the books of the Pali Canon in English. Uh, in the same way that we find in the Bible, exactly the same kinds of situations with lots of different examples, lots of different texts that were then sort of co uh, uh, collated and correlated by um, very knowledgeable people centuries ago, and then uh, worked into, into translations where we see a one, a single Bible, when in fact the history is, is really quite diverse. Also, clearly, if we look at these early texts, uh, in whatever recension we're looking at, there's, there's a lot of pretty obviously legendary material uh, that we find there. Um, we find uh, what seem to be, at least from a modern standpoint, sort of fanciful stories of, of the Buddha flying different places, of you know, people disappearing, of, of all kinds of, sort of super, what we might call supernatural kinds of miracles that we may, from a modern standpoint, consider to be evidence that these texts were perhaps monkeyed with, or that there's at least a lot of material there that we can't necessarily uh, trust. And if we look at later, uh, what seem to be later texts in that same material, and if we look at particular books that seem to be later, such as, the, let's say, the Jataka Tales, uh, other materials and other books, we find yet more of what seem to be kind of legendary material taken out of uh, even of other stories from other, other parts of India. I mean, I, my understanding is that certain of the Jataka tales uh, were just sort of floating around in India as, as just sort of stories that were told from one person to another. And, uh, you know, at one point uh, they were just sort of uh, hoovered into the, sort of the Jataka tales as part of the Buddhist canon, but, you know, but they were just stories that were floating around. And, you know, to the extent that we look at these and take these as uh, perhaps... Uh, examples of what happens to texts in, you know, preliterate cultures or just really any cultures, uh, we're going to say, well, you know, look, this happened in the Jataka tales. It could have also happened with the story of the Buddha himself. Indeed, even the question of the Buddha's own name, the the names of the people around the Buddha, uh, Siddhartha Gotama is the, is the what we know is the sort of the name to the, of the Buddha. Uh, the Buddha being just his sort of epithet, meaning the awakened one, but Siddhartha Gautama is sort of more generally his, considered his, his name. Uh, if we look, there's a paper, uh, an interesting paper by uh, Jayarava, who writes basically that, you know, even these kinds of, these names are not really necessarily the kinds of things that we can trust, because they may also come out of, of different epithets that were given to people at the time. And I'll put the, a link to Jayarava's paper down below if I can find a copy, if I, can, I, I believe I can find it somewhere on the web. And, and, but, you know, the same thing is true today. If we think of people like uh, the Dalai Lama, who's known as the Dalai Lama, but whose real name is Tenzing Gyatso. And as I recall also, um, Thich Nhat Hanh, the, the very famous uh, Vietnamese Zen Buddhist, also has uh, an epithet, that is to say that the, the name Thich Nhat Hanh is not his given name. It's a, an epithet that was given to him later. And we can understand how perhaps if Thich Nhat Hanh had lived several centuries or millennia ago, uh, we might simply know of him as Thich Nhat Hanh without really knowing what his given name was. That could have been just lost to history. So in the same way, uh, the Buddha's original name, uh, even his original name, Siddhartha Gautama, Siddhartha certainly was uh, an epithet of a, of, of a kind, and Gautama may also have just been a general family name, it may have been another kind of epithet given to certain people at the time, it's not entirely clear. So, I mean, if we dig deep and get very geeky about these things, we can find all kinds of, of strangenesses and uh, things that may concern us and things that will have to be worked out perhaps by further research and a lot of things frankly that will really never be worked out by any kind of f further research because we just are working with limited evidence. That said, in general, when I deal with questions like this in my own life, uh, questions that are very difficult to get one's mind around, uh, such as let's say issues of science, of global warming, or other kinds of, of, of controversial issues, my general uh, strategy, my general way of approaching them is to go to the experts. Go to the people who, uh, who spend their lives focused in an, uh, an academic, that is to say a non-sectarian non way, 
focused on these kinds of issues and, and look to what they think. And just as when one talks about global warming, we, we go to climate scientists and we find that uh, the consensus is, is overwhelmingly that, that global warming is real, that it's human caused, and it's a great danger to humanity. Similarly, uh, if we go to questions about whether the early Buddha existed, whether we can trust the texts, uh, what we'll find is, of course, a, a wide range of opinions uh, about various texts and what we, can, uh, what we can trust and what we can't, but there's a general consensus that the, that the historical Buddha seems to have existed, that, the, that they can trust at least that kind of aspect of the early texts. And here, I mean, I'm thinking about the, the, the leading scholars of early Buddhism today, such as uh, Richard Gombrich, such as um, K.R. Norman, who's no longer with us, uh, such as Rupert Gethin and others. Uh, if you look at my early, very early video on some books that I recommend on early Buddhism, you'll find some of these uh, scholars in those books. In other words, they were the people who wrote them. So if you're interested, you can take a look at that video. And one of the classic arguments uh, from Richard Gombrich uh, about the, the validity of the early texts is to say that he finds that there's a lot of hidden humor uh, back in those texts, a lot of kind of uh, not only plays on words, but satire that is unlikely to have been sort of constructed by other people after the fact and more likely by uh, somebody who's, who's, who has the, the authority to, to, to make these kinds of, of, of ironic or satirical or, or funny kinds of claims. And some of them, according to Richard Gombrich, some of the meanings of these arguments have been lost to history because the people who came after them didn't understand the, the Vedic context in which the arguments were being made. And so that is also an argument that there was something real back then, uh, somebody really arguing with other people, particularly believers in the Vedas, and that, that that sort of material has been lost. So if you're interested in, in Richard Gombrich's arguments, take a look at some of his books and you'll find them. Uh, for myself, I would say that uh, the early, the, 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 I should say the texts we find in the, in the Pali Canon strike me as credible particularly because of the humanity with which they portray the Buddha in many of the texts. What we find is, for example, that the Buddha is, is portrayed as somebody who feels pain, who, who gets tired, who, ha who gets sick, who gets cranky at times, uh, gets, uh, we might even say downright, it seems like angry or cranky with his monastics if, if they're making too much noise, if, if they're getting him wrong, if, you know, it, on many occasions. And so he comes across as a real human. And I think that's the sort of thing that we would be unlikely to see if the texts were constructed out of whole cloth by, let's say, a group of, of monastic of a certain kind, a group of believers of a certain kind, trying to sort of create a, a fictional um, uh, founder character who was a kind of a god. Uh, which is, what, of course, what happens in, in, in other religions or in other texts. And indeed, if we look at later texts, for example, from the Mahayana, we do tend to see that. We tend to see more of uh, a godlike Buddha, uh, a Buddha who isn't really human in any, in any kind of important respect, but is more of a mouthpiece for the Dharma. And there's a, a, a long essay by uh, Bhante Sujato and Bhante Ramali, who are two uh, monastics, Western monastics, who basically attempt to argue in, in great detail about the authenticity of the early texts and why we should take them as authentic. And this uh, paper, uh, has been hosted by the Oxford Center of Buddhist Studies, which is where Richard Gombrich uh, worked for many years. He was a professor at Oxford. And he, he put it on their site because he believes that the essay is quite good. And so I'll put a link to that as well if you're interested in reading it more at length as to sort of a lengthy uh, description or argument as to why we should take these texts in general as at least relatively accurate, uh, certainly accurate enough to say that there was a historical Buddha. In many ways, this debate uh, between uh, people saying there is a historical figure and, and those not is uh, mirrors a similar debate that we see in Christianity, uh, where basically the entire uh, field of scholarship of early Christianity holds that there was a historical Jesus, uh, but there are a certain, a small group of uh, basically almost entirely non-academics with uh, one or two exceptions, uh, maybe even only one at this point, who claim that there wasn't. Now, this debate nevertheless tends to be one that goes on quite actively in the popular culture, uh, on the internet in particular, and the, the great scholar of early Christianity, Bart Ehrman, who 
I should say he wrote a book about this subject, which I'll also link down below. Of course, that's about Jesus rather than the Buddha, but similar kinds of arguments, I think, can be made in both cases. And he makes, I think, a very, very strong case that, you know, obviously we don't necessarily have to accept everything within the New Testament, far from it, but at least there's enough material there for us to say that there probably was a historical Jesus. Um, and what's good about Bart Ehrman is that he, um, like Richard Gombrich or uh, Rupert Gethin, is not a monastic. I mean, he's not somebody who is coming from, you know, deep within the tradition in a kind of a sectarian way. Rather, he's, because he's not Christian. Uh, Bart Ehrman is not Christian. He, he, he used to be, but he left the faith uh, many, many decades ago. And so is writing from a position of agnosticism about the, the actual truth of the religion, um, but simply uh, believes that there was a historical Jesus. And in general, these are wonderful debates, in particular for, for non-specialists, in particular for people over the internet who, you know, may not have other things to do and so want to debate things like this, because there's no way to completely end the debate. Uh, these, these things are open questions to an extent. They always will be. Uh, there's no absolutely definitive evidence in either case. I, it, arguably, there's a little bit less evidence in the case of the Buddha, although there's more material from claimed to be from the Buddha, much more, in the Pali Canon and the New Testament. Nevertheless, since the Buddha lived a couple of hundred years before, even before Ashoka, uh, Ashoka's reign, and, you know, two, three hundred years before anything was written down, arguably, there's a longer period for things to get made up than in, in, the, in the period of early Christianity, where it may have only been decades or a century before the first texts were written down. So we, I think we'll all agree that these are questions that can never be definitively answered. Uh, there's no way for me to convince anybody who is absolutely dead set on, on not believing the Buddha existed. There's no way to convince them because, you know, it, it might be that he, he didn't. I mean, uh, we have a bunch, all we have are a bunch of texts. All we have are a bunch of stories. But the question is, does it matter? Uh, and does it matter to our practice in particular? I mean, does it matter to us today? Uh, obviously, if we're historians, if we're concerned about the history in it for its own sake, then of course it matters there. But does it matter to our practice? Does it matter to making our lives wiser and kinder and more uh, and, and less stressful, uh, less stressful, uh, more stress-free? Uh, does it matter for that? And I th and I think the answer is no, unless you know, unless we see ourselves on a path of a certain kind of faith. Now, there are different kinds of faith paths within every religion, and within Buddhism in particular. There's a faith path that says, you know, I, uh, basically a form of confidence, that's usually how it's structured within Buddhism, that we have confidence in the Buddha, we have confidence in what we've seen so far in our own lives. But if we're on a, a more, a more Buddha, you know, focused faith path, if we, if, if our faith is really faith in a historical Buddha, if it's faith in the the truth of all of uh, or of a certain group of texts about the historical Buddha, then yes, that may matter for us because uh, we may feel that if the historical Buddha didn't exist, then we, there's no one to have faith in. In the same way that it certainly is true in Christianity, that any kind of traditional belief in Jesus really does rely on him actually having existed. But if we're on more of a path, a wisdom-oriented path in Buddhism or a path that's, that's based around a practice and meditation, then it really doesn't matter so much for us about the historical realities uh, of, the, of the distant past. The Buddha is a kind of an ideal to live up to. It, you, we read the stories, we read what the Buddha supposedly achieved, and, you know, perhaps, you know, they were made up by monastics, but nevertheless, they're something that we can strive for. And in particular, we can say, look, uh, practice, you know, spend time on your practice. Do uh, focus on ethics in the world, focus on being a kinder person, focus on meditative practice, on trying to reduce stress, on trying to calm ourselves, on trying to pay attention to the, to the world as it is around us right now, both within us and without us, outside of us, and try to focus on wisdom, on, on trying to live a life, a, a life that is in harmony with the way things are, is in harmony with the changeable features of the real world, that is in harmony 
with the selfless nature of the real world that is in harmony with the fact that nothing is ever going to be completely satisfactory in the external world, or in fact within us as well, um, so that we have to understand the way things are and live wisely. And to the extent that we find that useful, if we see it bearing fruit in our own lives, uh, in a moment by moment and day by day, week by week, year by year kind of way, and, and uh, the Dalai Lama has said that Practice does take years, so we should think of it practice both within the moment and within, let's say, a period of a year or two years. If we see this having beneficial effects, then the existence or non-existence of the Buddha really, in the final analysis, doesn't, doesn't matter. And, of course, the corollary is true, which is if we don't see these things having any beneficial effect in our lives, if our practice doesn't seem to be leading anywhere, if it doesn't seem to be doing us any good, then it also doesn't really matter whether the Buddha existed, uh, because obviously if he didn't exist, then he didn't exist, and if he did exist, you know, uh, either we're going to say that the Enlightenment isn't real, or we're going to just say we don't know how to achieve it. So in either case, uh, whether our practice is, is effective or not, it doesn't really matter what, the, what history says. So while I personally am very, very interested in history, and I try to bring some of that to this channel as much as I can, uh, both from uh, the point of view of, of trying to find real history about the past, as well as from the point of view of simply uh, presenting the texts and trying to present them as interesting literature that may be useful to us. Nevertheless, although it is inter all the history is interesting to me, in the, you know, again, in the final analysis it has to do with practice. So uh, I'd be interested to know what you all think about this. Uh, in particular, um, do you find that, that the practice is useful to you? Do you find the discussions of the historical Buddha uh, are useful? Do you find the arguments about uh, the validity, about the, the, the believability of the old texts are useful? Um, to, the, to, to an extent, all of us are going to have to pick and choose those texts that we find most useful. It, within a secular tradition, we're going to tend to pick ones that are a little bit more down to earth and tend to leave aside texts that aren't. But, you know, all of us have to do the same thing, and no matter what religion we're from, no matter what belief system we may be from. So I hope that this is useful. Thanks so much uh, for all of you, uh, for my subscribers. Thanks so much for, for being with us, uh, for paying attention to these videos, which I know you could be doing lots of other things. Thanks so much to my uh, patrons over on Patreon. If you're interested in lending a hand and checking that out, checking out the posts I have over there and other, uh, other goodies, uh, just click the link down below. It'll take you right there. So thanks once again, and we will catch you on the next one of these videos. Meanwhile, be well.